Hi everyone! In this video, we're going to summarize everything we've learned in Chapter 7. Um, so we're going to talk about SN2 versus SN1 versus E2 versus E1. So what we'll do is we'll kind of step through some hypothetical reactions. Um, so for instance, down below, let's say that we have a good nucleophile that is a bad base. And let's try to figure out what type of reaction we would have if we have a methyl carbon bonded to the leaving group versus a primary carbon versus a secondary carbon versus a tertiary carbon. So we're essentially going to try to figure out, you know, will we have substitution? Will we have elimination? Um, and then we'll narrow it down to, is it a first order reaction or a second order reaction? Or do we have a mixture? So in this scenario, again, we have a good nucleophile that's a bad base. And you might remember from last week that we said good nucleophiles that are not good bases are, for instance, the halides. So chloride, bromide, iodide, but not fluoride. Fluoride doesn't count. Or sulfur groups. Those are also good nucleophiles that will not act as bases. Okay, well, right off the bat, I know that I'm not going to have any elimination reactions here because we have bad bases. And remember that elimination reactions need a base. So let's just write no elimination due to bad base. Okay, so that makes this a lot easier. We know we're gonna have some sort of substitution reaction. Okay, now what if we have a methyl carbon bonded to our leaving group? So what if we have um, CH3 bonded to a bromine, for instance? Will that go through SN1 or SN2 or both? Well, remember in an SN1 reaction, we form a carbocation first. So is a methyl carbocation stable? No. So we know that we won't have an SN1 reaction if there is a methyl group or a methyl carbon, I should say. What about SN2? Will that still occur? Yes, SN2 doesn't care uh, in this sense because the nucleophile will attack first um, and the leaving group leaves at the same time. So SN2 can happen here. So let's just adjust and we'll write SN2 only if you have a methyl carbon and a good nucleophile. Okay, what if we change our molecule slightly and we make the carbon bonded to the leaving group, a primary carbon. Will we have SN1, SN2, or both? Well, again, a primary carbocation is not very stable, so SN1 would not occur. But SN2 is okay with primary carbons, since the nucleophile attacks first or in the rate determining step. All right, so this one is also SN2 only. What about a secondary carbon? So let's change our 
reactant slightly here. So we'll add another methyl group on there. So if that carbon attached to the leaving group is a secondary carbon, will we have SN1, SN2, or both? We could have either. So it could be SN1 or SN2. And this is where it really depends on the solvent that you're using. So do you have, for instance, a polar protic solvent, a polar A protic solvent, or it can also depend on the reaction rate. So which reaction would occur faster or um, slower? Okay, now let's look at the tertiary carbon. So let's say we have yet another methyl group bonded to this carbon here. Will that be SN1, SN2, or both? Well, in this case, with the tertiary carbon, it's going to be difficult for the nucleophile to attack with all of those other groups attached to it, um, attached to the uh, tertiary carbon. So SN2 isn't likely to occur because the nucleophile attacks right away. Uh, but SN1 would work because we would form a tertiary carbocation, which is very stable. Okay, so let's just write SN1 only. All right, so let's do the same thing we did here, but this time we're going to change our good nucleophile to a good base. All right. So remember, um, there are a few good bases that don't act as nucleophiles, or they're bad nucleophiles. So we said that that could be tert butoxide, uh, maybe a hydride like sodium hydride, lithium hydride, or potassium hydride. Or it could be a bulky base like DBN or DBU. So again, these will not act as nucleophiles. All right, so let's step through our different types of carbons here and see what will happen. Now, right away, I know that SN1 and SN2 will not occur because we have a bad nucleophile. So again, that makes this a little bit easier to figure out. Our only options will be E2 or E1. Okay, so what if we have a leaving group attached to a methyl carbon? Will we have E1 or E2? Or both or neither? Well, to start, we know that this forms an unstable carbocation, um, so E1 is out. What about E2? Well, we need a beta proton, right? So do we have any beta carbons? No, we only have the alpha carbon. So we don't even have any beta protons for the base to deprotonate. So neither occurs if you have a methyl carbon. So what we'll do is um, let's just write a big old X there. And then we'll put an asterisk and say that E1 and E2 do not occur. due to lack of beta protons. 
So there are no beta protons. All right, what if we do add on another group so that we do have some beta protons? All right, so our alpha carbon here is a primary carbon. Um, so would we have E1 or E2 or both or neither? Well, again, primary carbons don't make stable carbocations, so E1 is out. But E2 can occur here because there are beta protons, so that can work. E2 only. And actually, I'm going to save us a little bit of time. Um, E1 does not use a good base. Um, E1 uses weak bases. Uh, so actually, if you have a good base, then you're going to see E2. And we already said that substitution doesn't occur if you have a good base, since they're bad nucleophiles. So all of these are E2 only. And we'll just write a little note down below. E1 uses weak bases. So E1 reactions are actually kind of rare, um, and we'll see that as we go along. Okay, so now what if we have a good base that can also act as a good nucleophile? So remember from a while ago, we gave some examples of, the, of uh, this type of base slash nucleophile. And we said that it could be something like the hydroxide ion or really any oxygen that is negatively charged on a group as long as that alkyl group is not bulky. Okay, so let's just step through the same process and figure out which type of reaction we would see. Now, in this case, we can't really rule anything out because we have a good nucleophile and a good base. So it could act as either a nucleophile or a base. Um, well, actually, I lied. We can rule out E1. E1 uses weak bases. Okay, so we can rule out E1, I lied. But uh, we still have to decide between SN2, SN1, and E2. Or maybe we form both, or I mean uh, two of them. <laughs> All right, so let's start with a methyl carbon. So we have three options, SN2, SN1, and E2. What could happen here? Well, similar to our last two discussions or our last two slides, um, we said that elimination can't occur if there aren't any beta protons and we only have an alpha carbon here. So E2 does not work. Also previously, we said that SN1 um, can't occur if we have a methyl carbon because we'll form a really unstable carbocation. So can SN2 occur here? Yeah, we have a good nucleophile and SN2 doesn't really care about that methyl carbon and its instability because we don't form a carbocation. 
So in this one, we would have SN2 only. So if you have a methyl carbon and a good nucleophile. All right, what if we add on another carbon so that we have a primary carbon? So now we do have some beta protons. All right, so again, we have three options, SN2, SN1, and E2. Which ones are likely to occur? Well, let's actually rule out SN1 because we know that primary carbocations are unstable. Can SN2 occur? Yeah, we have a good nucleophile. Um, what about E2? Yes, we have a good base and beta protons. So SN2 and E1 can occur here. Now, this brings up another discussion. Which product would be the major product? The SN2 product or the E2 product? And I'll just give it away here. The SN2 product would be the major product. The E2 product would be the minor product. And this is due to the fact that um, the nucleophile can attack the back of the uh, alpha carbon really easily. So SN2 is major because um, of the easy backside attack. So the nucleophilic attack is really easy to perform on a primary carbon. Additionally, if you think about what the E2 product here would look like, um, we would have, let's see, yeah, we'd have an unsubstituted double bond, yeah. So that's not very stable. So that's another thing to keep in mind too, is how stable is the elimination product? Okay, so now let's walk through what would happen if we add on another carbon, and I'm just gonna move this um, hypothetical substrate so that it's not blocked by words. Okay, so now that alpha carbon is a secondary carbon. And then we have two beta carbons. So we again, we have three options. SN2, SN1, and E2. So for this one, even though previously we said that SN1 and SN2 could occur with a good nucleophile, um, in this case, we're actually going to see just SN2 um, as a substitution reaction. And we'll also see E2 um, just because we do have beta protons there and a good base. Now, for this one, the major and minor products are switched. So SN2 is actually the minor product, and E2 produces the major product. And the reason for that is just the bulkiness of the substrate. So now SN2 produces the minor product, due to the fact that um, the back side of the molecule has those extra alkyl groups. Uh, 
Okay. All right, so now let's go on to the tertiary carbon. And that means we're adding on yet another CH3 group here or any old alkyl group. This is a hypothetical substrate. So would we have SN2, SN1, E2, some combination thereof? So we already said that SN2 forms a minor product if there's a secondary carbon because of that bulky backside. And if we add on yet more carbons, that just creates an even bulkier backside. So SN2 does not occur. And actually SN1 also doesn't occur in this case, um, mostly just due to the fact that it typically uses weak nucleophiles. So E2 is the only one that occurs in this situation. So I'll just write um, SN2 does not occur due to bulky backside. Okay, now our last set of nucleophiles and bases. What if we have a bad base that's also a bad nucleophile? All right, so remember, these would be, for instance, alcohols or H2O. All right. So let's assume that we again have a leaving group bonded to a methyl group. What type of reactions would we see? Well, we said previously, if we have no beta protons, then elimination cannot occur. Um, if there's a bad nucleophile, SN2 cannot occur, and we're also forming a really unstable carbocation, so SN1 cannot occur. So nothing happens if we have a methyl carbon and a bad base that's also a bad nucleophile. So let's just take some notes on that just so we remember why. So SN1 does not occur due to a bad carbocation or an unstable carbocation. SN2 does not occur because we have a bad nucleophile. And then E1 slash E2 do not occur because there are no beta protons. All right, now uh, let's move on to our primary carbon. Okay, so we do have beta protons this time. So we could we potentially have some elimination reactions? Well, E2 would prefer to have a good base. So E2 won't happen here. Um, E1 won't happen because we have a bad carbocation. Okay, so those don't happen. What about substitution reactions? Well, SN1 wouldn't work because again, we have a bad carbocation. Um, and SN2 wouldn't work because we have a bad nucleophile. Okay, so again, nothing happens. 
Now, the reasoning for this is a little bit different for E1 and E2. Um, so let me just write here E1 slash E2, uh, bad base, bad, nu or, uh, bad carbocation. Oh, actually, let me flip that. I don't want you to get confused when we're talking about this. So E1, bad carbocation. E2, uh, bad base. There we go. Okay, so then, um, oh, and also, let's see, SN1 and the SN2 reasoning still applies for the primary carbon. All right, so let's move on to our secondary carbon. Okay, so what will happen if we have a bad base and a bad nucleophile? So in this one, let's see. SN2 needs a good nucleophile, and here we have a bad one, so that's not going to work. E2 needs a good base, and we have a bad base, so that's not going to work. So it's down to E1 and SN1. Well, we could have either, uh, really. We could have E1 or SN1, and... It's actually the same for our tertiary carbon. We could have E1 or SN1. So which is favored? Well, it depends. If you have a high heat during the reaction, uh, that will favor the elimination reaction. And we talked through that a little bit last week when we talked about the entropy of the reaction and how that relates to Gibbs free energy and temperature. And we said that elimination reactions have more entropy, so they're going to spontaneously occur at higher temperatures. Additionally, E1 will be favored if you have catalytic acid. So something like sulfuric acid um, or phosphoric acid and a secondary or tertiary alcohol. So we'll talk about that in a second. We'll do a practice problem. And so that will favor E1 as well. Otherwise, if you have a low temperature, then you'll favor SN1. All right, so this is all summarized in that table that we went over previously. Um, so this might be a good one to practice writing out on your own. And just kind of thinking through the reasoning behind each of these uh, different categories. And, you know, why does a primary carbon with a strong nucleophile favor SN2? Why does nothing happen if we have a secondary carbon and a weak base slash weak nucleophile? Um, so remembering those different properties will help a lot with memorizing this information. You can also make um, flashcards too. That helps a lot as well. Okay, so let's actually go over a practice problem involving um, that catalytic acid and a tertiary or secondary alcohol because I'm sure you have a lot of questions about it. And then that will be the last thing we do for this last lecture. You made it. Okay.
you'll have to celebrate after this and eat your favorite food or take a nap or whatever you want to do. All right. So let's say we have a secondary alcohol, and that just means that the alcohol group is on a secondary carbon. And then let's say we add catalytic acid, and I'm just going to write that as a proton in brackets with CAT next to it. So that is catalytic acid. So that again could be um, sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid, for example. And then let's say we also heat this reaction. So I use a triangle to symbolize heat. That's fairly standard in chemistry. Okay, so we just said that with these two things, uh, we favor E1 reactions. So we know that this is an elimination reaction. Okay, so what's going to happen? Well, we know that OH is a bad leaving group, and in order to leave, it needs to convert itself into a better leaving group. And luckily, there are positive hydrogens floating around due to the acid. So the oxygen is going to grab onto one of those hydrogens. And now we have an excellent leaving group. So the leaving group is going to leave. And we have a carbocation, as well as a water molecule. So what type of carbocation do we have here? A secondary carbocation. OK. Uh, can we make that a more stable carbocation? Well, there is a hydrogen hanging out on the carbon next door, and maybe that hydrogen moves over to give us a tertiary carbocation. So that would be a 1,2 hydride shift. Now, why didn't we move the methyl group? Well, let's see what would happen. If we moved the uh, methyl group over, that would give us another secondary carbocation, right? So that doesn't work. That just gives us uh, the same type of carbocation. So that, that one is not going to work. So we do want to perform a 1,2 hydride shift. OK. So now we have our water molecule and our carbocation. And the water molecule can actually act as a base. It's a bad base, but it can still act as a base. And that means we need to take a hydrogen from a beta carbon. Now, the alpha carbon is wherever the positive carbon is. And then the beta carbons are next to that. So let's draw all of the hydrogens that the water molecule could take. OK, so there are quite a few here. So what if the water molecule takes a hydrogen from the top methyl group? 
Well, we know that that hydrogen will leave its electrons behind to create a double bond, and that will get rid of that positive charge. All right, what if um, it takes a hydrogen from the other methyl group? Well, that will also leave electrons behind. But that's actually identical to the first molecule that we drew, right? The first product. Um, the bonds are just rotated differently. And these are actually identical. So if we tried to name this molecule, um, we would find that the longest chain with the double bond is the same. We have one, two, three, four, five carbons in that chain. And then we just have a methyl group as our substituent. So those two are identical. So that means we don't really have to worry about the second methyl group and its product because it'll just be the same. All right, so I'm just going to redraw that product. OK, but if we take um, a hydrogen from the other beta carbon, the last beta carbon, that will give us a different product. So the double bond is now in a different place. All right, so let's look at these two products. Um, which one is more substituted or more stable? The one on the right. The double bond has three groups on it, whereas in the first product, there are only two groups bonded to the double bond. All right, and then um, that means that the product on the right is the major product, and the product on the left is the minor product. Here's another question, which one is the Zaitsev product and which one is the Hoffman product? So remember the Zaitsev product is the one that's more substituted. And the Hoffman product is the one that is less substituted although my pen does not want to write Hoffman. There we go. <laughs> okay. Now, another question before we go, what is the relationship between these two products? Are they enantiomers, diastereomers, constitutional isomers, or identical? So we know they're not identical because the double bonds are in different places. Um, they could potentially be diastereomers if they were cis and trans, but they're not. So really, they're just constitutional isomers. Uh, let's see. So if these are constitutional isomers, is this a stereospecific reaction, a stereoselective reaction, um, or a regioselective reaction? Regioselective. Remember, regioselective reactions produce an unequal mixture of constitutional isomers. Okay, so this problem gave us a lot of different concepts to think about. Um, and this is really the only E1 reaction we've looked at. 
But again, when we look at our summary table, E1 reactions don't occur very often. They have to occur under very specific circumstances. Um, all right. So that's the end of Chapter 7 material. Um, I will post a couple of other videos going over some of the worksheets that I've posted so that you can get some practice in before the final. Um, and if you have any questions, remember to message me or email me um, or set up a one-on-one -on -one office hour using Calendly. Or you can email me if you don't know how to use Calendly. That's fine, too. Um, and good luck studying. I know this is a lot of information, um, but next quarter we are going to add on even more information. So, uh, you know, this is nothing. Um, so I will see you in my other videos.